Our Racing Heroes today is honored to have a well-respected engine builder of all time, one of the best in my opinion. And Waddell Wilson, it's a pleasure to have you come over and talk to us, give us a little information about your history, how you got into racing. I've competed against Waddell and I know that how good he was and everybody knew he could get power out of the engines and he had good drivers, worked for Holman and Moody. Um, one of the only guys that ever won the Daytona 500 three times as chief engine builder and crew chief. Uh, the other guys that only won at one time was Smokey Eunuch and Ray Fox, I believe that would be correct. And also Waddell was the engine builder for uh, David Pearson in 68 and 69 when David won the championship and also 1973 when Benny Parson won the championship. So with those credentials, I'm interested to know, and, and the public and the race fan would like to know a little bit about you and how you got started. Uh, I think I recall you being in Miami, had a race car that you built, and uh, later on moved back to North Carolina. Can you tell us a little bit about where your interest was at? Did you ever think you was going to be building engines, or just how did it all evolve? Well, it's amazing how it, <laughs> how it escalated along. You know, whenever I tried to graduate from Nice and Lost to D College, Diesel College, I ended up in Miami and uh, ended up getting an old race car and uh, run it a few times, won a race or two, and then erected and then took all my money. So I ended up back home and I worked at the Ford dealership and lost my job. And uh, so I went to come to Charlotte to uh, see if I couldn't get work. Cause when I was in Miami, I was working at, a, at Cummins Diesel as a diesel mechanic. And Charlotte, I was looking for the same work for a couple of days, couldn't find anything. A friend of mine asked me, said, well, why don't you go over to Home Money and see if they got anything going on? I said, okay, that's to myself. I said, that's a joke, but I'll go. So I go in and run into the foreman and uh, the general manager, he said, we're not looking for anyone. So I started back out the door, run into John Holman. He said, can I help you? I said, well, I'm looking for employment. He said, well, step in my office. I was telling him what I've been doing and been racing, and, and when I told him I graduated from Nice Walk to Diesel College, he said, where's your toolbox? I said, well, I can be here in the morning first time. What time? He told me 8 o'clock. That's, that's all I knew. I had a job, be there at 8 o'clock, nothing else. Never met him before in your life? Never met him, knew of him as it. Yeah. So the next morning I went in, and the general manager was waiting on me, put me in the engine room. And I could tell the look on his face. He said, I'll put you in here and you won't last long. <laughs> so anyway, I went in there to building engines. There was only six of us. And uh, I didn't know it at that time, but they were going, when I'd go to break or go to lunch, they were going over everything I was doing, checking every, you know, out, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get rid of them because I wasn't in that clique that, at that time. And this is 1963. That was first of 63. Yeah. Anyway, finally Lee Terry, he was over the engine room, one, one fine person, and he told these guys, he said, he said, let me tell you something, we got somebody special here, I think we need to lay off of him. So anyway, time went on, and I, the second week I was there though, they put me on Fireball's pit crew. So I worked with him. And then I remember in 63 being in Daytona with Fireball. And back then, you know, he drove that race car, penny loafers, dungarees, and a t-shirt. No gloves, sunglasses, three-quarter helmet. And uh, I remember during the race, he'd, he'd come up to me and tell me now on pit road, he said, now I don't remember now where you go with that pit sign, because I had the pit sign. He said, now I'm gonna follow you. Well, it was one of them pit stops. He come down pit road, and he and Junior Johnson had actually lapped the field. And uh, back then, didn't have no pit road speed. Had them old drum brakes. And he come to me, he was about two car lengths away from me, and I knew good and well he wasn't gonna be able to stop that thing. And I remember I didn't move the board because I knew he was gonna chase me. <laughs> so as soon as he got next to me, I jumped straight up Landed back on the windshield, rolled off the windshield, and done the work, and nobody ever said a word. He ended up winning the race that day. 
So anyway, we ended the season well, and and at the end of the season, Ralph Moody and Fred Lorenzen come and said, we want you to be on our race car, and we want you to be the jack man. So they moved me over on Lorenzen's car, which uh, that's the car I really liked anyway. So anyway, work with Lorenzen, we go to Daytona in uh, 64, and that's when Richard showed up with that petty blue plan with, with that Hemi in it. And uh, Lorenzen said, that, that looks like a box, it won't run. Richard didn't even unload it the first day. And the second day he got in, he run about three or four miles out faster than we did, and Lorenzen went to the motel. We had done it for a month. So he come back and I said, well, let's work on the car. But, you know, let me, I'd like to try some things on the engine. He said, okay. So anyway, Herb now was a crew chief on the car, and, and Wayne Mills was his assistant. And, uh, you know, they had all they'd done, they, you know, had the car set up they wanted. There wasn't nothing wrong with the car, and I started working on the engine, trying to figure out changing cam time and changing this and that about the engine, because I'd heard all these stories in the engine and what made a car run at Daytona. So this was time for me to find out, and I found out a lot of things just working, you know, with the wrens, and we'd, you know, it, We'd a lot of time be at breakfast together or dinner at night, and uh, that's all he thought about was that race car. What can we do to make it go faster? He was a hands-on guy, wasn't he? He was. I mean, he was amazing to work with. He was a genius. And I learned so much from Freddie working with him those days and those years. And uh, But he was one of them guys that could get the best out of it. You wanted him to win, and I remember building engines for him. And if I put that on the dyno and it didn't run right, I'd take it, spend the night by myself, I had to, and rebuild that engine. You know, I just couldn't let it go out because, you know, I wanted to win too because we got a little percentage out of the car whenever it won the race. So anyway, we learned so much down there, but then Richard ended up winning the race. We put cam shaves in, in uh, fireballs and rings and you knew they wasn't gonna last. They blowed up about halfway through the race. So anyway, we stayed down there. I had to stay, and they built a fair lane at, uh, at the shop. Uh, we was running them big galaxies at that time and sent it down from home in Moody, and Fireball was lived there, so he stayed there, at the, and we run the fair lane that time down there. That's the first time we run a fair lane. And NASCAR was, or Ford was hoping to get that approved because, I mean, at that time, you know, Chrysler had us beat with them Emmys. But anyway, the next race was Atlanta. And we go to Atlanta. When we go to Atlanta and test, we go to Bristol and test. I mean, you know, we stayed, you know, you just didn't get no sleep at that time. You know, you're working all the time, going or coming. And uh, so we won Atlanta. We won Bristol. We won the next seven races. One of them was a road course. We won in USAC up in, in uh, Indiana someplace. Anyway, then we went all the way up to 600 and then that's whenever Fireball got killed and yeah. we had some bad pit stops. We didn't win the race there, but it was amazing to work with Lorenz. And then at the end of, the end of, seven, uh, the end of 64, you know, uh, things changed around then. It's a different pit crew, you know, uh, Jack Sullivan come in as crew chief. Herb and I went to Junior Johnson's, but uh, that's when they delegated some of the cars away, like up to Juniors and. Well, yeah, Junior had his own deal. Yeah. The Wood Brothers had theirs. Banjo had his. Bondi Long at that time had a car, so. But they get all of them still got the engines from Home and Moody. Oh yeah, Home and Moody built the engines. Like I said, there were six of us in and we built engines for all the race cars and. Wood Brothers too, which had they run Mercury, and uh, then in uh, in '74, or I mean, uh, and Lorenzo wins the Daytona 500 in uh, in '65. Uh, that was uh, I remember the rain shortened race, uh, and lucky to win it. Beat Marvin Panch. He was driving for the Wood Brothers. Yes. Uh, when I went to work for Home and Moody. I forgot to bring this up. It was in first of 63. There was only uh, 39 people on the payroll, including the secretaries. So it wasn't a big group of people. Mm -hmm. 
and and building race cars and building engines, built all of the tires, had uh, the parts department also. So it was quite an operation for a very few people. I believe, you correct me if I'm wrong, Peter DePaulo. Pete DePaulo. Had it, and uh, Buddy Schumann worked for him and Ford, and he died over in Hickory at a motel. Uh, the mattress caught on fire. And then um, I believe that's when Home and Moody was formed right after that, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And then you come aboard with them, and they had, what, 30? You said 30, 39 people. 39 so people. When I come to work for them, and that was the first of 63. But I never figured this. Maybe you can tell him. What did John Holman contribute, and what did Ralph Moody contribute? to the organization. Well, Moody, Moody was a race car driver, come from New England. He had been driving cars in New England for several years, and he'd been very successful at it. And then Holman, he was more of a manager. It, you know, he didn't uh, drive or any of that, but he knew, and I never remember him working on a race car. But he was able to, he was able to, his brains enough to put, get behind it and put it mm -hmm. together. He was and, the mouthpiece for Holman yep, Moody. Yep. He and, was. Uh, I guess that Moody was behind the scenes deal. And they put all these guys together, including yourself, and it developed and kept developing. And uh, you was telling us about you started with Fireball and then the death over there of, at Charlotte Motor Speedway of the great Fireball Roberts. And what kind of impact did that make on the team and you? Well, you know, it was hard to believe. I remember the day it happened, and it was on the back stretch, and I've never to this day seen it black smoke come up from anything that bad. You knew it was horrible, it had to be horrible. And, you know, of course, it didn't, he didn't die at that moment, but it was a couple, two or three weeks later when he passed away in the hospital. But when they brought the car into the back shop there at Holman Moody and put a cover over it, and I remember they, uh, the custodian brought always uh, cards, you know, had cases of them and put them in the trash can. I remember that, and I thought, what a sad thing. Yeah, you know, I don't, a lot of people probably don't know this, but in that period of time in stock car racing, they had a 55-gallon drum with fire retardant in it, and you put your uniform, which whatever your uniform was back then, it could be a T-shirt, pair of pants, right. or it could be a jumpsuit or whatever, and you dip it down in it and hang it on the Fence, fence. Let it dry. That's how they did it. But Fireball was allergic to it. And that's why he did not have any fire retardant uniform or clothing on. And of course, that fire, I think his car was upside down and the fuel run down in the top of it and it ignited. And it was a sad day for stock car racing. But after Fireball's day, if I, as you were saying, I guess it did make a big impact on y'all and you moved on to uh, focus on. Fred Lorenz's car. Well, I was already on Freddie's car at that time. I'd moved from the end of 63. Uh, that's when Lorenz and, and uh, Moody come and wanted me to be on Freddie's car and be the jack man. I didn't know it was going to lead up you know, to building the engines also. I, they didn't mention that at that time. But, uh, you know, it was a horrible thing when Fireball, because he was what kind of like uh, some of the people we have today. He was a spokesman for NASCAR. Good and Pretty much, yeah. you know, Fireball was. And it was hard to lose a man with that statue. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I recognize that, and I guess NASCAR did too, because in 1961 and two with Smokey Eunuch, they advertised that car a lot, sitting on the poles, leading the races, and then the engine blew a whole lot, or he blew a right front tire and put it in the wall, but the next race he'd be flat footing it again. And they had a nickname for him. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, <laughs> Fireball. No, Balls. Huh? They called him Balls. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I never heard him call that. Yeah, that's what they called him back in the 60s because to drive one of those Pontiacs, you knew the right front tire was going to blow with the tires they had back then. And the way See, Smokey was not a real good chassis man that period of time. You know, they just they wasn't that far advanced with chassis and what you no. could do to a car. And um, they relied upon the tires, and a lot of times that never never worked out too good. But with Fred Lorenzo, one of the all-time greats, and NASCAR Hall of Famer, of course, you've worked and built engines for a lot of NASCAR Hall of Famers, but 
with Freddie, and then a period of time he moved on. I think he retired, and then they brought David Pearson in or Bobby Allison. I don't know which one they brought in first? I believe it was David, wasn't it? It was David. Yeah, and uh, y'all did very well. Well, let's go back to fireball. You know, that was one thing. It, every time it seemed like a key player gets killed in racing, something good comes out of it. And that's when Firestone got got on the ball, and they right. put come out with a fuel cell. Before that, they was just regular gas tanks right. that you run in streetcars. And, uh, you know, we just seen that escalate throughout all the racing right on up to... Earnhardt got killed, and that even brought more things to play to right. make it, mm -hmm. you know, drivers a lot safer. Because Bill Francis say a lot of times, we can't lose our key players. We can't lose men. And he always had, he, you know, he's always referring to his race drivers and, and uh, mm -hmm. putting on a good show, and he couldn't do it without them. That's right. Uh, mentioning the fuel cell, I guess that's one of the greatest things ever happened. Um, to a race car as far as safety is concerned. Prior to that, they did put them in a metal container with two straps run parallel and two of them run perpendicular, and that was it. Yeah. And uh, of course, that tragic death fireball brought uh, more safety, and as you mentioned, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the best things they've ever done. And I wish fireball could have uh, had an experience where that had already happened way down the road. But he was just a good ambassador for, for he stock was car great. racing. Yeah. He really was. And I know that you got along with him well and, and also uh, with Fred Lorenzo. And we come on forward to um, another guy, David Pearson, that started back, I guess, in the late 50s, but notoriety probably with Ray Fox in 61 and those Pontiacs. And right. then you ended up with him. And that David Pearson always had a hell of a feel for an automobile. I guess that you picked that up pretty quick on his chassis and how he mingled with people and got along with the crew. He was he was a very individual to work with because I was fortunate enough to work with some of the greatest drivers and and uh, you know he was definitely one of the greatest you know and um, when he come to drive home in Moody cars you know um, there was Dan Ford at that time and Jake Keller and myself we had the race cars. And I built the engines, and and uh, Jake and Dan took care of the car, and then we'd meet, you know, take the car to the racetrack, and uh, I took care of the engine at the racetrack. They took care of the chassis, and uh, on, you know, and then I was the front tire changer then, on uh, Pearson's car. And y'all running how many races? Well, in '68 and '69, we run a hundred races the two years, and I remember we. I, when I was over, we'd won the championship both years against Richard Petty, which is, you know, quite a job to, and quite a feat to do that. But uh, I'd averaged over 70 hours a week, never had no sick leave, holidays, no vacation or any kind. And, uh, How many people working on the car? Just, the, well, full of, I mean, it was three of us, then the pit crew come in on the weekend, and that was it. And I built a brand new engine for every race. And wasn't you building something for AJ Fort too in that period of time? Maybe other teams. It was uh, at times, you know, we had, you know, times we'd build engines for other, for other drivers. In '65, uh, you're talking about out at Charlotte. Whenever uh, I was building engines for Lorenzo and, and uh, Holman come back in the engine room one day, and he said, "You're building engines for the company car." I said. Dick Hutcher just come to my office and he said, if you build an engine for a company car, you need to build for him also. So, can you build him one? I said, well, that's what you want me to do. So the next day, he come back here again. He said, well, I got another job for you now. He said, A.J. Foyt called Ford and said that they'd, he'd run Charlotte if you'd build his engine. So I had to build all three of them. And uh, during the race, you know, Fireball was, go I mean, uh, uh, AJ was going for the lead and wrecked his car, and then it ended up Lorenzo won the race and Hutch run second, and come to work Monday morning nobody ever said a word. <laughs> <laughs> and this was in the days, folks, that you didn't have engine parts coming down an assembly line with one guy checking valve springs, another guy doing the valve job, uh, another guy fitting bearings, another guy fitting rings. This is the day that the guy here, Waddell Wilson, and, and engine builders did all the work. 
run the machinery and the whole deal. And I'm amazed that he was able to do that. Having done some of it myself, I know the hours and dedication involved. And you had to work a tremendous amount of hours and, and really be dedicated to what you were doing. And not only that, you were also in the development stage. In other words, if you made a lot of horsepower, it needed to last 500 miles. Yeah, you had two objectives, you know, make power and then run 500 miles. And and it was a challenge, believe me, to make that happen. And But a normal day at home when Moody back in those days was 8 in the morning or 10 at night. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you got off, uh, you'd work eight hours on Saturday and Sunday. But uh, it, was a, it was a tough go. My, my next question, what else, and I wonder about this, you made a statement, A.J., uh, said that he would drive if he could get you to build an engine at Charlotte. Um, your engine outperformed the other engines built by other engine builders also working in the engine shop there at Ford. What was it about your engines, and if you'll share with us, what did you do that made your engines run better and last and win races that the others didn't do? I mean, you, you had to make an impact on drivers because they all wanted your engines. Later on, the wood boys wanted your engines, but tell us what it was that you did. Well, at the time, I wasn't thinking anything about it. You know, I, I had a certain way of degree in my cam in. You know, I did a certain way of fitting my brains, my rings, you know, how I hone my block. You know, there's just so many things that, and I guess my wife can tell you this better than anybody, I, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. And I want it as perfect because I can make it whatever I do. And, uh, you know, and working with the people I work with, and I was scared to death of John Holman and not do a good job. And, uh, you know, you just, and you're always thinking about what can I do to make the engine better. And then I'd always like Lorenzo when he was driving the car, and, and I talked to him and some of the good after the race over. If we had to build that engine over, what would you want to change about it? Would you want to have more bottom end, top end? Where would you want to run better at? And, you know, we'd always go back and forth. And, and you know, that's another thing that the drivers help me as much as mm -hmm. anything to tell me what they're looking for. Now, I don't know if anybody else, you know, went to the extent I did doing things like that. And even when I become crew chief, you know, that's what I'd ask the drivers as soon as it's over and while their man, mind was still sharp, you know, what can we do to make the car better? And, you know, when you win, it don't matter. You still got to run next week, and everybody's gunning at you then. Yeah. So you, you're always looking, you know, to another plateau. How can I go better? Well, having said that, I've always thought of you as being an engine man, one of the best ever. And uh, everybody knows who Smokey Unit is, and I feel like everybody knows who Waddell Wilson is. And... Uh, I go back a little bit further maybe than you do in involvement because I remember Red Ball, uh, Hugh Babb, Joe Wolf, and some of them. You've heard those names before. But uh, there just seems like there's certain people excelled in their career in stock car racing. And uh, when I think of engine builders, I think of Waddell Wilson. And I mean that as a compliment, Waddell. Right. I mean, really, people respect you. Uh, but then you started being a crew chief. Now, how did that happen? I mean, that's unheard of. <coughs> Well, when I went to work for Harry Rainier, well, after I left uh, home in Moody, you know, built engine for, uh, uh, you know, went to LG, built for LG to whip, which is Benny Parson and Bobby Allison. Well, did you go, did Moody uh, split with? Uh, yeah, that's whenever, well, home at the end of, well, we had a great year in 71 with Bobby Allison out of home in Moody. We won so many races that year, you know, big races, you know, and uh, then in the, then I went to work, in, well, at the end of 71, and then in 72, the Wood Brothers come on and we build our engines. So I built the engine for them in 72 uh, with uh, A.J. and Pearson. And then in 73, I, I left and went to work with Moody because mm -hmm. he left home with Moody. And uh, Bobby left. And uh, so then I built the engine for, uh, Benny Parsons and uh, Bobby Allison. He won the championship of Benny. Yeah. In yeah. 
And one of the oddest things that ever happened in my career is whenever Benny won the Daytona 500 in 65, I mean in 75. I mean, what happened, we were at Riverside and Benny didn't, and LG didn't have a lot of money to race on. So there was a guy who brought a set of pistons. Benny said, here's your set of small block pistons. And he come over to me, table this, and I looked at him and said, Benny, those are drag race pistons. They don't work, I don't think. So we made, we come back to the shop. They had, they went to Daytona, borrowed money from old man France to run some of the season with. They'd get advanced money. So anyway, we could, he had enough money for me to build one engine. So I built an engine. And and then he said, well, but I don't have nothing. Just build the other engine out and use these pistons. And I said, they ain't going to work. So we, I built an engine with that. Well, then we're sitting there, and I need another engine. So I go through those parts in 74. You know, that's the first time he downsized from big block to small block. Yeah. And they, you know, wasn't my street parts and blowed up on how many engines. So anyway, I go through the scrap pile basically and picked up enough parts to build one engine with. So when we get to Daytona, we're going, and Benny said, well, let's put that engine in with those pistons in it. You know, the ones I got the new pistons. I said, okay. So he said, we'll run a few laps with it and then we'll take it out and put that other engine in. So we get, he runs a few laps and that thing blowed up with them drag race pistons in it. Then we got that old engine that I built, how they was used parts. And I'm thinking, well, this is going to be a joke. So anyway, we qualify with it. We uh, get the 125, I think it was 125 at that time. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we fall out of the race. Something happens to the car. So anyway, we start back 30 something, 30 seconds, what it was. And then it come down next to the end and we're leading the race. Well, anyway, we end up winning the race, and I'll never forget, we got in victory lane, and Benny Parsons, I thought he was gonna squeeze me to death, and LG, he, he, was, he was excited, he couldn't even enjoy it. I've never seen nobody excited <laughs> about nothing like he was. I mean, the bar money to get down there, and they go down there, and they win the Daytona 500. Well, then they call me and tell me, well, you gotta take Tinger Park and check the boring stroke. Then I got thinking, how big is that thing? What did I parts did I use? <laughs> you know, because it started out at 396s and then they parked to 358. And then did I get some of them parts mixed up in that? Well, anyway, we check a board stoke and it was fine. Because first of all, I didn't want to do it. Because I was, I, and it popped in my mind about the time he went across the start finish line. How big is that dang it? You know, I would, oh, so help me, I wouldn't give you $200 for that engine. You know, it, just a bunch of used old parts that wasn't worth anything. Yeah. But that was the most amazing race, and then the one, to win one of the biggest races. Is that when you become crew chief for long and day? No, I think. Well, what happened then after I? Well, Travis but, was down there too. Wasn't yeah, he? Travis was yeah. crew chief, and he was a great guy, great to work with. But anyway, then I worked. Then I was traveling back and forth to, from Charlotte to Lake. Off, I was living on Lake Norman and going down to Ellerbe, and there's 100 miles one way. And I told LG in the middle of the season, I said, LG, I can't keep doing this. And Roger Pence had come to me, and he wanted me to build engines for him. So I took a job, met him at Charlotte Douglas Airport. And I went back and told LG the next day, I said, well, I'm gonna leave you. And it was halfway through the season. And I'll never forget the old man sat down on a set of pistons and he said, what if you can't leave me? I said, you gotta stay with me because I'll lose my sponsor at First National City Traveler Checks that time. So, and two hours later he had me talked into it and I hated to call him Pent Roger Penske and tell him I wasn't gonna be able to come work for him because I wanted to go to work for him because I, I had a lot of, I really admired the man and still do today. So anyway, I, I worked at the end of the season. Well, we end up the last race was Ontario, and we come back to Vegas, and I played blackjack that night. Normally don't never play anything, but I just unwind and sit down with a couple of dollars and play blackjack. Well, I couldn't lose the money I won that I had sitting up there in front of me, so I ended up playing till I was just unwinding from the year. 
And somebody taps you on the back and say, oh, gee, do it. He said, let's go have breakfast. Okay. So we go and have breakfast. He said, I've got it all figured out what we're going to do. You're still going to stay with me, and I'm going to get you an airplane. LG, I can't fly an airplane. <laughs> no, but he says, my pilot is, a, is an instructor in Rockingham. He said, we'll get you a license. I said, LG, I've done told her every year I was going to work for him, and I, I, and I promised you I'd work for him. And I said, I fulfill my agreement. He said, I said, I can't. So anyway, I hate to leave that old man. That was one of the nicest men I ever worked for. So then I went to work for Harry Vernier, and we had uh, Lenny Pond to start with. One couple of races with Lenny, he was a good guy to work with. And then uh, here come Buddy Baker, and we had a couple of races there, and things weren't going too good. And finally, Harry Vernier came down, and he said, well, he said, whether you know it or not, you're going to be the general manager crew chief, engine builder, and all. And I started to say, no, I don't want to do that. And I'm thinking, dang, all these years I've been building engines, and all I do is argue a lot of time with the crew chief about what gear you put in the car, you know, what I see is happening to the engine. I'm going to have to argue myself no more. <laughs> so I said, okay. But the thing about it, people don't realize, back in the home of Moody days, Ford Motor Company had the finest engineers in the world, and I was able to, on all the tests, work with them. And I learned so much from those guys. It wasn't building an engine, it was being working on cars at the racetrack. And it was amazing, you know, the things that I learned from those guys. And then, you're always there working on the car, just like the other guys, working on the chassis and whatever. They wasn't like, a, you know, wasn't blinded to any of it, knew everything that was going on. So then to fulfill that, you know, part of it, it was no big deal, you know, to be crew chief. You know, you'd seen it all happen, and, and at times you had to play that because something happened to one of the guys, a crew member, and you played that part. But uh, anyway, you know, it was... Well, well you, you become a crew chief, and uh, something that you never experienced, but then you realize it's going to work out. And um, then your next, I guess you stayed with Rainier. How long did you stay there? Um, well, I left uh, in uh, 80, 86. Okay, is that then you went to Hendricks? Yeah, I went to Hendricks. And that was with Ricky? No, that was with Daryl. Daryl. Yeah. Okay, didn't Ricky drive for you? One yep, time? Ricky Rudd. Yeah. And how did it work out? Was that the dream team when you went? No, that was Daryl. That was, well, you know, that, that was a bad chapter. But uh, Daryl and I, you know, I was loose, used to working with Kelly Yarbrough. He, he, you know, he was so easy to work with. Now, he, Kel come to Rainier, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Seeing it, well, let's go back to Rainier's. You know, when I went to work with her and then become crazy, and then and then in uh, 1980, you know, I had uh, getting ready to go to Daytona. There wasn't but three of us in the shop at that time. And uh, that's the year the car flew, literally flew, wasn't it? No, you're talking about Kale now. Well, okay. Kale, the car flew when Kale was in. Right, right. All right, and say, we, you go ahead, put all this out, this bad. You keep going. <laughs> And you get mixed up with all these dates and everything. And drivers are coming on a good. Well, I mean, there's so much that you did, it's really hard to keep it in order. <laughs> it is. It's, you know, and then think of. 82 or 84, Kel took over? It was 83. 83. Yeah. And then 1980 was when Buddy Baker won. Yeah, well, let's go back to. All right, then. At the end of 79, there was only three of us left in the shop. And uh, so I've got a full-bodied race car, and I want to naturally go back and win Daytona. So I take the Bob, the race car to Bob Sweetack and have him do the body the way I want it. So anyway, I'd go back at lunchtime, and I'd check on the race car. No, nope, I'd pull the strings down the side, 
do everything, you know, the angles I wanted and all. And I'd tell him, yeah, that ain't it. Well, this went on for three or four weeks. And finally, he got the car the way I wanted, and I picked up the race car. When I picked up the race car, you get, you know, a couple thousand dollars to buy your race car, easy back then, ready to go. I had a $10,000 bill. And I was like, God, that's going to get me fired. So I never did tell her every near. So anyway, I'm in, I'm in the shop through the holidays working and saying, I'm the only one I know that's working. And I built the engine four times. I'd build it. I'd see something I didn't like. I'd build it again. So we go to Daytona. We sat on the pole. We won. I don't remember what I would won up to the 500. And uh, I remember Bill Francis come in there to me and he'd say, boy, he said, you're stinking up the show. I'd say, Billy, I'm not doing anything wrong. And I could tell every night they had the cover off the race car, checking it over, seeing if they could find anything that was right, not right about it. And I remember Sunday morning of the 500, I was, they paged me to come to the office during the garage area. I go in there and Dick Beatty, Runs everybody out and he sets me down over and he says, let me tell you something. There ain't nobody here who wants to run around, run against that race car today. I said, but Dick, there's nothing wrong with the race car. It's as legal as it can be. He said, we know. But he just want, he said, I just wanted you to know. So anyway, we ended up winning the Daytona 500, which the record still stands today for the fastest 500 miles. And uh, we're in victory lane. And somebody told Harry Vanier, said, Harry, you won 103,000. It's a record that you won today, besides the race record. I said, Harry, sorry to tell you, but you won 93,000. He said, Yo, I said, you owe 10,000 for that race car. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's the only time it would have been okay. That but Harry Vanier was one of the finest men that I was ever around. Mm -hmm. You know, I just like I said, I'm fortunate enough to be with good owners and good drivers, you know, through through that part of the year. And then here come Kale, and he was, I, I knew him at home with Moody when he was building engine crates, begging John Holman for a ride in a race car. He'd build the crates for us to ship engines off with. And that's all he wanted to do was drive a race car. But anyway, I never worked with him really until um, whenever he come driving in 83. Well, we go to Daytona, and uh, Perry wants me to bring both cars down. I have the Pontiac Le Mans and I have the, the Chevrolet. And Chevrolet wanted me to go with them at the end of, of uh, 82 for the 83 season. I told them I would, so they sent me the sheet metal and all to build that car. So we took the car that the year before that was when Benny was driving it, and that's whenever the first time anybody run, broke the record at Talladega of 200 miles an hour. And I remember that day as, you know, I didn't think no nothing big about it. You know, we just, we're on the pole, Benny's on the pole at 200 plus, whatever it was. And I go outside to get some tickets or passes for the boys that bring their wives down and get them passes for their wives. And I mean, they're going hysterical. And, outside in the offices and said that, man, the phone ain't stopped ringing because that was a magic number, 200 miles an hour, and we can't keep up with all the calls right now that all the tickets were selling. And that was the first time I said, well, I guess we did do something great. Yeah, about it was. It. But uh, anyway, we didn't end up winning the race. But uh, then when Kale come to drive the car, and we go down to Daytona and test, and and uh, and AJ Fort comes down there and he wants to drive the Pontiac. Well, we go down there and test, and uh, you know during the testing, you know both cars were good. AJ was happy with this, and him and Harry wanted to know if I could run the second car. And I said, Well, I can't. I don't have enough parts and pieces and manpower or anything to do it. So that's the end of that. So in the meantime, we go to the wind tunnel. In, in Detroit and put in the car and the car was extremely good in the wind tunnel and um, everything I'd ever learned about a race car went into that car to try to 
get it as good as I could for Daytona. And you were still and, crew chief in this period mm -hmm. of time, right? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, the drag numbers and the horsepower I had was supposed to run over 203 mile an hour is what they figured it, it would run at Daytona. And uh, nobody had broke 200 mile an hour at Daytona at that time. We had done it the year before at Talladega. So anyway, when we show up and 45 flat was 200 mile an hour and Kale's out there running 45, 70s and 80s and I'm thinking, what is wrong with a race car? Why is it not running? And finally in passing me beside the race car, he said, what if we're okay. I said, well, I'm surprised we're not running anybody. He said, don't worry about it. He said, I tell you, he said, I'm gonna tell you something. He said, I ain't never been in nothing as fast as this. He said, when I go down the back stretch and hit those bumps, little, he said, this thing has enough horsepower, it spins the wheels. Spinning the tires. And I said, no, that's, and he said, now when I go into turn three, it's like you hold a needle and me try to thread it. He said, it's unbelievable. So anyway, that's when you could put the spoiler wherever you want it. And it'll be in a notch back at Chevrolet. So we go out there to qualify, and I had it down at, I think, 20 degrees. He puts it down to probably 10 or less. Yeah, it, actually, it was yeah. had to where it had lift, not yeah. down. And he come around on the first lap, and he run a 4470-something. And I'm tickled to death, you know. That's over 200 miles an hour. The guys in the tire came down late and told me what happened. He said they were jumping up and down happy, but finally somebody broke 200 miles an hour at Daytona. And he said, when we were clocking that car down the back straight, said, you think that's something? He's on a clip now at 203 mile an hour. Well, he goes into turn three in there, and between three and four, the, you know, it actually flew. It got upside down and ended up over in turn four. So we, uh, Dick Beatty come pick me up in the fire truck. We go up to the turn four and there's the car. It's back on its wheels. You can tell it been upside down. And the fireman was standing there beside it. He said, well, he jumped out of the car and said, the only thing you want to know, did he break 200 mile an hour? <laughs> so go to the infield care center. Kale's in there with the top of his uniform down. They're checking him out. He looked up at me like a whip up and said, well, you done everything right but one thing. I said, what's that? He did put the controls in so I could fly it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I called yeah, my I called son him. in Charlotte and told him to bring up Pontiac Le Mans to Daytona because we didn't flip the Chevrolet. And, uh, but anyway, when we come back in the garage to tell that part of it, you know, there stood Harry Vernier. He said, well, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. He said, you want to fix it or whatever. And uh, Bill France got me over the corner and he said, what else? He says, I know you want to keep your records that you, all the years you've been sitting on the pole with different drivers and different cars. And uh, if you can keep the car, keep the frame rails, and build the rest of it, and I'll leave somebody here with you, and you work on it 24 hours a day up until Thursday, and you got to start the 125, and then you don't have to finish the race, and then, and then be ready for the 500. So anyway, Chevrolet called. Anything I needed in Detroit, they would ship it down. And uh, so anyway, I walked over to the men, they looked at watch and said, we're not going to work on it. said, in two hours, we're going to be at happy hour, and we're not going to work in the car. So that kind of ended that. And I knew that, you know, Bill Francis upset. He was aggravated because I wouldn't fix it. And, you know, he and I had become good friends through all this stuff that went on at Daytona. And, uh, but anyway, I remember Glenn or Leonard Wood come by, and he said, what if you're going to regret you didn't fix that race car? And I've thought about that a lot of times. You know, I, I should have figured out some way of fixing it. But then the most comical one that come by was Junior Johnson, him and his friend. And they, his friend told me about it later. He said, he walked over and looked at the car and he said, anything goes that fast, I ought to turn over. <laughs> That's Junior. That's Junior for you. Yeah. But anyway, they brought the car down. And we qualified it on a Monday, only 195 mile an hour. But we didn't have time to, you know, do a real, you know, work on it like we had the Chevrolet. But anyway, we uh, brought the Pontiac Le Mans down to Daytona. And uh, Kale ended up winning, winning the Daytona 500 that day. 
we came back to 184 and we did sit on the pole and won the Daytona 500 in 85 or 84 also. So it wasn't 83 and 84. When Bobby come to drive our car in, in 81, we go to Riverside. That was the first time, last time we run the big cars. So Bobby wins a race at uh, Riverside. And we come back and go to Daytona to test and we have a, Osmo, a Oldsmobile we're testing. And the first lap around the racetrack, I told Harry Vanier, I said, that car won't run a lick. He said, well, he ain't, he ain't even trying to go fast. I said, he won't because listen to it. You know, the way the front end was designed, it was, there was fighting against itself. So we didn't know what the legal cars was. So we get a list, go out. So I sent one of the guys out to NASCAR and find out what the legal cars was for 81. So they come into the list. There's a Pontiac Grand Prix, Pontiac Le Mans. We didn't know what a Le Mans was. So we go by the dealership that night and said, you know, ask them if they could show us one of those cars. So we got a picture. We don't have a car here, actual car. So anyway, there it is, a fastback. So I called the guys at the shop and uh, told them to get sheet metal and, and be able to put that car together. So they did. So we go through Talladega to test it when, on the way to Daytona. And the car uh, run good, but by my watches, it wasn't as fast as they called Daytona and told us we run. But when we show up at Daytona, unload the car, and I figured there'd be a lot of those Pontiacs down there. But we're the only one. So the whole group of them load up in a big town car and go out to Bill France, brought him back in. What well, the hell, how'd you come up with this car? I said, well, here's your list. Signed by Bill Gasaway. He looked at that and he's, he asked Bill Gasaway, he said, did you not check these cars out before you okay them? And he said, turned around to me and he said, what about another car? Don't you have another car that you can bring us to this? That's it, that's all I got. So he said, well, it's a legal car. So they didn't have no templates that fit it. They finally found a car. They didn't found one in Florida. They found it in Georgia. They brought it down there and they took two days making t the templates to fit it. And then when they put the templates on it, it naturally wasn't going to be closed. But it was all in our favor. If we could have built it by the template they made, it would have been a lot quicker <laughs> race car. So anyway, we had sat there all that time, and we only got an hour. We only got just a few minutes of practice after, you know, before we garage was shut down for qualifying the next day. So Bobby goes out there and runs, come back in. Then the next day qualifying, well, we go out there and sit on the pole. And then that really irritated them. But in the 500, you know, we come down, Bobby led the race most of the day and ended up running out of gas on one of the, ga on one of the stops. I'm still wondering, did we misfigure it? Did we not get it full? You know, how did we mess up? That, that still bugs me today that we'd lost that race, that Bobby run us so good. But we ended up second to Richard Petty, and that was one of the races that really hurt. But uh, we ended up second at points that year, had a good season with Bobby, and then, you know, that's when when uh, Cale comes to drive yeah. the car. And Bobby's a good guy to work with, too. Wasn't Bobby, was, Bobby was one of the best chassis men. He was good with the car, good with the driving, good to figure out what was a race car. You know, he had all, the, all of it going on. Well, how'd you end up uh, finally over at uh, Hendricks with Ricky Rudd and, and almost won the championship that year. Well, you know, when Ricky come to drive the car, you know, he was he was uh, one of the finest boys I ever worked with. And, and knows, you know, knew a lot about a car, you know. And uh, it was a shame that uh, we didn't end up winning the championship. What hurt us that when we went to Sonoma and we ended up uh, passing Davey Allison on the last lap, and then they took the race away from us. And that that ruined the rest of our season. We just won Darlington the week before, and then went out there and and won in that race. And then Bill France and I, you know, we had it out in the trailer over it, and he kept telling me, said, well, don't get this personal. And his wife, Betty Jane, back in Daytona said, well, that's the end of that friendship. 
And uh, I just told Billy, I said, Betty, don't ever do another team like you just done us. I said, you've never, this has never happened before, and why did it happen now? now? And Dick Beatty wasn't there. He was over the, over the garage, but he didn't make that trip to the West Coast. He called me up on, when I got back home, and he said, what if I'd been there, you'd have never, I'd have never took that race away from you. So anyway, you know, it was a lot of bad hurt in the team. You know, the guys gave up. You know, we ended up winning, ended up second in the points. We should have won, won, but we didn't. And I bet it affected Ricky too. Oh, the it, team. his wife and him both. It, you know, it was, it was one of them things that's even hard to talk about today. Yeah. He was a go-getter, in my opinion. Ricky was. He's a wheel man, wasn't he? He was a wheel man, braver than Dick Tracy. You know, he was. You know, he was something to work with. You know, he, it was an honor to work with him. What do you call him, the rooster? He was a rooster. <laughs> and uh, then what? you worked with him one year or two years? A couple uh, of years. A couple of years. Yeah. And then uh, where'd you? Worked with uh, Jeff Bodine. You know, worked with him over at Hendricks, and Jeff was a good guy, mm -hmm. you know. There's one thing in Hendricks that I'd, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll say it. But anyway, whenever Harry, whenever, uh, Daryl and I were together over there and, and things wasn't clicking. And then uh, uh, Tim Richmond would come by the shop. He said, what hell? I want to come drive your race car. He said, come on, let's go downtown to see the Chevrolet where Rick Hendricks is and let's, let's swap this. Well, I did, he didn't tell me him and Harry wasn't getting along, but they wasn't getting along. And I've always regretted that I didn't approach yeah. Rick Hendricks with that and see how that would have went. Cause that would have been an honor to drill for him to drive that race car. He was, <laughs> and when you go to looking at the numbers, um, the greatest race car real. drivers ever, he'd had to be right at the top, wouldn't he? When Tim Richmond, I mean, I, that would have been a fit because he would have been just like working with Kale Yonker. Mm -hmm. Or maybe and, and Kale's day, you couldn't beat him. No. And, no. Uh, of course, Earnhardt, everybody recognizes him, and, and it's true, he was a great race car driver. Right. But. I recall many races, Tim would be out front and wait on him so he'd have somebody to race with. That's how good Tim Richmond was. He Inside was unreal. He kind of track. He just had a feel for race cars. He did. If it was sideways, he could still get to go straight. Unbelievable. He had the ability and the nerve to go together. Uh, what else, you know, we've talked before about the guys building engines today and what we used to work with back in the day. and. Um, this is, a, can you believe they used to cut the domes out of the cylinder heads or something like that? Not really. That was back in the 1940s. It's a rat tail file. They ground it, put a pile on it, and put it in a drill press, clamped her head down on the bed of the drill press and bring it down and check it. And, and that's what they used to use. And then, uh, I know you're familiar with these. This is your needle yep. torque wrench. And, uh, but one you don't see very often, but this is the first snap-off type of uh, torque wrench. You right. turn it here, it breaks here. That dates back in the 40s too. Pretty old. And then we was talking about doing piston clearances. Right. Check the drag on the piston with a fish scale. Right. And then as we talked earlier, you could generally get the feel of it and know how much drag. And take a, a bucket, heat it with a settling torch and put the pistons down in it and then put it in the block and hone it some more until it felt just right. It may take a day, but that's the way they've done it. Yeah. Now, when, when you come along in 63 over at Home and Moody, um, I don't know all the equipment they had. I know they had a dynometer. And, uh, a dyno, yeah. Yeah, and then they probably had a uh, line bore machine. And no. Didn't have one of those, no. okay. Didn't have nothing to hone. You can hone them. We had to hand them in with a three-quarter uh, yeah. horsepower and use a sunning type uh, hone on yeah. the drill. And if you got that hone caught in that webbing, he's going to flip you with that block one. Yeah, three-quarter. And uh, all your cylinder heads were hand ported, yeah. probably. And uh, did they have a flow bench? They it uh, later on, yes. Later on. Now you look at that. It wasn't as it, when I went to work for Holman Moody. It wasn't as modern as you'd think it was. By no means, the dyno was a big plus we had. 
And at that time, we'd only run the engine up to 5,500 RPMs on the dyno. It was an outside dyno mm -hmm. with a shed over it. And, uh, but, you know, we had, the, back then we had, you know, trouble with cam bearings and, and uh, valve train trouble that you have today. Yeah. There's always a limiting factor of an engine. Well, you really were an engine builder because you literally took everything from the engine that came from the factory that you could get at the dealership probably and you had to finesse every piece there. Yeah, it was, it would, Ford would send them in there in crates and then truck load up. And we'd take and disassemble and what they call blueprint the engines, you know. Mm -hmm. We'd actually put the same rods, crank, you know, pistons and all back. We'd CC everything, fit everything, you know, to balance it, we'd do all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, redo the heads and everything. But it was the same engine you could have went to the dealership and buy. Right. Same thing. And today it's a little bit different, isn't it? Major. <laughs> Major. Uh, do you really think there's engine builders today, can we call them bad, or just assembly guys? Well, you know, it's amazing to know how the, how the sport has escalated from that time to this time. They couldn't imagine walking in one of the engine rooms today that we had back in the day. It's like when I walk in the engine room today and it's amazing, I look around and I say, why couldn't we had just a little bit of this mm -hmm. when I started? Yeah. And before it's ever built or made, it's uh, engineer draws it out. And uh, before it's ever assembled on a race car or in an engine. And uh, how much help did you have in the engine room on your engines when you built them? Well, I'd done all the work on the engine except, you know, we had one guy that done the cylinder heads. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then as far as honing everything, I always honed it, cleaned it, you know, done it, all that myself. You know, each engine builder had his, you know, that was what they were supposed to do. And how many today you think they have? No. It's, it's a similar line, isn't it? It is. Well, you know, one guy hones, that's all he does. One guy fits the bearings or the rings or whatever, and that's all they do. They just, it, like you say, it's a similar yeah. line. And the pieces you had to work with, I think you mentioned something about cam bearings. Um, you didn't have as much uh, reliable engine parts back then, but you were one of the people who helped develop that stuff. And today, an engine's almost bulletproof. I, I guess the valve train, the valve spring's still the weakest point. And what a set of valve springs today costs, you could probably build an engine for back in <laughs> the 60s and 70s, you know. I understand they're pretty expensive. Yeah. What else could you tell us what you're doing today? I'm working with Jericho Transmission people, rep them, and you know, you know, it's been a, a very good job. I've enjoyed it, Jared. You know, it's fun to get go back to the shops and people used to aggravate me. Yeah. Now I get to aggravate them. And now Jericho is known for drag racing. Drag racing, old track, you know, yeah. the straight cut gears and transmissions, mm -hmm. which they sell all over the world. You know, the drag racing. You know, uh, circle track racing and oval and uh, road course racing. So you still get out to the tracks and and uh, mingle with the drivers that you used to know. Of course, today I guess there's a lot of new drivers that you hadn't known. Well, I don't go as much as I used to by no mm -hmm. means. Well, I just wondered, and I know the fan race fans uh, talk about you still and wonder what you're doing, and and uh, is the wife still doing okay? So far, and she's been able to put up with you all these years. And a wonderful lady. I bet so because she didn't know she had a husband until later on. You've had, you got two <laughs> sons, haven't you? No, there's uh, four kids, four three, three, boys three boys and boys. one girl. Are they in racing? And my son Greg, he worked for Joe Gibbs. He's a tuner on the 20 car. Lisa, my other daughter, uh, my daughter, she's uh, take, she's on the shovel car program. Mm -hmm. And then Freddie, he worked for Sam McToolin. And then Gary, he's a uh, he's a welder. What well, else? Back in the 70s, I was building engines, and engine builders like to get the latest information and, and uh, the hot tips, pick up some pointers on building. And you come out with a book, Racing Engine Preparation, a complete performance guide from building a tuning race engine. And uh, I still have it. And I have it all these years. I've, I've written in it and uh, made notes in it. And tell us a little bit about how that happened. I know that's one of the first engine books ever, probably, on performance building engines for racing. Well, Bill, uh, when I was working with Benny Parsons in 75, 
Steve Smith and he done one on race car drivers, how to drive a race car. So when they finished that, uh, they come to me and wanted to know if I'd do, want to do one on the engines. And I thought, well, okay. He said they'd give me a dollar a copy. I said, well, I need some money anyway, so I'll do it. Didn't think nothing about it doing any good. So got the book finished, and he said, who can we get to endorse the book? I said, well, I can call up A.J., and he'd probably endorse it for me. So I called A.J., and he said, yeah, I'll endorse it for you. Just send me a couple of books. So A.J. gets the book, and a couple of days later, A.J. Fort calls me up and said, I ain't believing you've done this. Why? He said, well, you're crazy. So anyway, the boys on the West Coast was buying, and they got this book, and it certainly helped them. You could tell it when we went to the West Coast. They had a problem then. And then, I heard, you know, it sold all over the world pretty much because I I had to disconnect my phone. I had to get, the, get a new number. People would call me from Alaska. They'd call me from South Africa. You know, want to know about this and that. And then the funny thing about it, uh, all, you know, engine builders would buy it and Smokey Unick bought one. And he's, one of his men told me one day, he said, he was wondering about something. He said, I'll go in and get that damn book what I wrote and I'm going to see what he says about it. <laughs> so it sold and then the first thing I know, you know, I, I got supposed to get a royalty check and it get a little bit of nothing. I said, dang, I've signed more books than that. <laughs> so I told, called up Steve, and I said, Steve, let's discontinue the book. No more books. So we, I stopped it. Well, that's a great book. Yeah, yeah people guess. still uh, run into me about it. and You know, it, it's a still a basic it book is. you can build in you from it today. Mm -hmm. you had no all idea the information's in there. You had no, no idea what was going to happen. None whatsoever. And you didn't. You felt comfortable by telling people, even though you knew you may have to compete with them. <laughs> I mean, you know, you I didn't. I figured. I figured is what I was telling was common knowledge. It, to me, it was, but it wasn't. Well, it's a little more than common knowledge, and the respect that you have that that shows it right here. Would you sign that one for me if I get a pen? I'd like to have you sign it because it's been my collection. One. I've had my collection of books for years and years. Well, thanks so much, Waddell. I've enjoyed it. And uh, I hope that uh, folks out here watching this will now know that they have listened to one of the greats in stock car racing. And he's still associated with some of the people in stock car racing and drag racing. And a big thank you once again. All right. Thank you. An old four running on a red dirt road. The stars are bright and the moon is low. Revenue man coming up behind. Bet he thinks he's going to catch me with this load of moonshine. But I cut the lights and mash the gas, turn a curb into a straight line. 